tonight on SoCal Connected. How many of you at some point were hooked on prescription drugs? All of you. Prescription drug overdoses claim a life every 14 minutes. It's a lot easier to get than heroin. You go into mom's pill cabinet, you know, you go into your friend's mom's pill cabinet. When I first started out, I didn't think that I would become addicted, you know, because I thought, it, well, it's, be, it's coming from a doctor. Legal drugs that are killing our kids. He would justify it and he'd say, Mom, all I'm doing is taking the pills that the doctor gave me. SoCal Connected starts now. Good evening, I'm Val Zavala. Tonight we devote this half hour to the number one cause of accidental death in America. No, it's not car accidents. It's prescription drug overdoses. In fact, you may have some of these drugs in your medicine cabinet right now. Painkillers, antidepressants, or stimulants. They can be addictive and deadly. For some Southern California families, the problem hits tragically close to home. Here's correspondent Michael Oku. I mean, what's, what's this one? This was when he was in eighth grade at uh, Palm Desert Middle School. Eighth grade. Marching band. That was before everything started He's going such downhill. He's an all-American looking kid. I know. Wow. Kathy Creedon's son, Ryan, was a boy any mother would have been proud of. He was in marching band for three years. And he was a straight-A student. He loved going to school. He played every sport imaginable, karate, soccer, basketball, t-ball. But that was before things changed, before his teenage years, when Ryan began experimenting with drugs. He was introduced to prescription drugs by a roommate, from what I've been told, and that became his drug of choice then. There was never any more meth, never any more cocaine. It was all prescription drugs. From then, it was the opiates, the narcotic pain relievers that really took him down. And then this was his first dance. So when Kathy Creedon dusts off those old pictures, she's haunted by her son's transformation from a fresh-faced kid into a full-fledged drug addict and angered at a system she believes enabled that addiction. He got really, really thin. You could see the bones sticking out of his shoulders, and he was just like skin and bones. And so when I, when I finally would see him and I would look at him and see him like that, I would say, Ryan, what are you doing? Um, and he still wouldn't admit that he had a problem. Kathy says by the time Ryan was a young adult, he had become adept at manipulating doctors to prescribe him a variety of pills for everything from back pain to anxiety. Do you think that the fact that the drugs were legally prescribed um, led him to believe that he wasn't hurting himself? I think you're absolutely right. Because when I would find him under the influence and say, Ryan, how many of those pills are you taking? You, you, your words are slurring. You can't stand up. You know, you, um, it seems to me that you've taken too many of the pills. And he would, he would justify it. And he'd say, Mom, all I'm doing is taking the pills that the doctor gave me. Pills that a cast of doctors prescribed him time and time again, even after Kathy told anyone who would listen that Ryan had become a drug addict. So every time something would come in the mail saying that he had a doctor's appointment, I would find out who the doctor was, and I would try to get my foot in the door to go and, and alert the doctors of his uh, history of, of the abuse and the addiction that he had to these narcotics. In 2008 and 2009, Ryan Creedon overdosed on prescription drugs multiple times. He was also in and out of rehab and arrested for trying to alter a prescription. And yet, Kathy says, he still managed to persuade doctors and pharmacists to provide him with more prescription pills. I remember driving down the road in my car while I was on the phone thinking, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this. My son has overdosed numerous times and nobody is willing to help me figure out how to save my son's life. Ryan's HMO was Kaiser Permanente, and its doctors and pharmacists were the source of at least some of the medications he abused. Kaiser officials said they can't comment specifically on Ryan's case because of privacy, but they did speak to us about the guidelines they use to prescribe these drugs. We're in the business of treating patients, and patients come to us uh, complaining of pain, uh, depression, stress, whatever. Uh, with regard to prescription drugs, uh, 
Um, you know, we want to trust our patients. We want to believe our patients when they're complaining about pain, as an example. And my job is to help people. So, um, you know, the first things first, we, we want to make sure that we're appropriately managing pain. Ward Blanchard, now a friend of Kathy's and a former addict himself, says abusers learn how to take advantage of health care providers. Whether it's anxiety or, you know, red eyes or leaning to one side, doctor's manuals will list those symptoms specifically. And so I will read those, start to understand what the doctor's looking for, and I will tell the doctor what he's looking for. Ward, a one-time star athlete, says he practiced perfecting his act. I would dress up like a golfer. I'd put my khaki shorts on. I'd put my nice polo shirt on. I'd put a tee in my mouth. I'd put a visor on, and I'd put a golf glove in my back pocket, zip up my golf cleats, and I'd go inside in urgent care with a hurt back that I just hurt on the 18th hole with a nice long drive, and I just dropped my club as soon as I hit my ball, and I just felt it all the way up my back you know, all the way up the side of my back. I felt it. And, you know, he would sit there and he'd push on my back, and, of course, it, it didn't hurt one lick, but if he pressed one spot, I would jump and jerk, and, and that's it. It was done. He was sold. He was hooked. And I'd walk out, minimum 30 milligram oxycodone pills, minimum. And at that time, I was taking about 30 Percocet a day, 30 to 40 at that time. Today, Blanchard speaks to health care providers about addiction. He's hoping he can help other parents avoid the nightmare Kathy Creedon suffered with her son, Ryan. One thing that I try to get across the doctors is a drug addict is thinking about that drug every minute of every hour, every hour of every day, every day of every week, every week of every year. And he's thinking about you a lot more than you're thinking about him. And he's going to find a way to get you. And that's just the way it is. In the fall of 2009, while helping her daughter move into her college dorm, Kathy Creedon got a call from her son's roommate, the call she had been fearing for years. And he told me that um, there was something wrong with Ryan. I started calling all my friends, asked if they could hurry up and get over there, something was wrong with Ryan. And a few minutes later, I couldn't wait. The paramedics arrived at the same time I called back. By then, my friend was there. and. I heard in the background the paramedic give the news to my friends on the phone. And that's how I found out that my son had passed away. Sadly, his story is not uncommon. From 2004 to 2008, the estimated number of emergency room visits linked to non-medical use of prescription drugs has doubled in this country. In Orange County, more than 200 young people have died from prescription drug overdoses in the last three years. That grim statistic inspired two Orange County moms to produce a documentary they call Overtaken. Out of 15 friends back home, probably five of them are dead, and the other 10 are still doing exactly what I was doing. Most people can't kick this thing. When the time comes for you to decide... What are you going to do? We sat down with several of the young people featured in the film, all now clean and eager to warn others at risk. So let me ask you this, just by a show of hands, how many of you at some point were hooked on prescription drugs? All of you. How many of you raided your parents' medicine cabinets or some other adult med medicine cabinet? Not you, Aaron. You go into mom's pill cabinet. You know, you go into your friend's mom's pill cabinet. Cole Edwards is 21. He says he started using OxyContin at the age of 15. For a year, I got it from my best friend's mom. She was prescribed it. She had multiple surgeries. She didn't need as much as, you know, she had. And, uh, and so she'd sell it. She'd sell it to you? To the high school kids, yeah. Not just me. So she was dealing oh, prescription yeah. drugs? Absolutely. 29-year-old Aaron Rubin survived a coma brought on by an accidental overdose of OxyContin and other prescription drugs. The former football player is now quadriplegic. He communicates by using hand gestures, raising one finger to say yes and two for no. Thank you. Give him the boom. Appreciate it. Do you ever feel frustrated by 
the inability to warn people about your own experience. Yes, is what I'm hearing there. According to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, 40% of teens think prescription drugs are safer than street drugs, and a third believe they aren't addictive at all. It's something that happens with families that, you know, have health insurance, that are in more fluid areas that can afford these things, um, and we don't want to talk about it. No one wants to admit that they have a problem. Dr. Matt Torrington is an addiction specialist. He agrees privileged teens are more at risk. I think uh, middle class and upper middle class people have more access to these medications because they have more access to health care. That's what we heard from the young people we met. Taryn's mother moved to Orange County for its good schools. Like, I used to be a cheerleader and I did graduate, you know, on the honor roll and, and uh, all that. And I, I was running on the streets and I was in jail and I'm on probation and, you know, that's where this disease has taken me. When you can take an 80 milligram pill of OxyContin and crush it, that was like pharmaceutical grade heroin. And I don't think anybody realized how dangerous that was going to be until the patients started abusing it and getting very, very addicted to it. Even many doctors didn't realize the dangers at first. OxyContin's maker, Purdue Pharma, paid more than $600 million in criminal and civil penalties stemming from an FDA investigation into the way it was marketed, including claims about its addictive qualities. The company says those practices have long since ceased and it has reformulated OxyContin to make it harder to abuse. But the trend toward prescribing more painkillers hasn't stopped. In 2009, um, enough hydrocodone was prescribed for every man, woman and child in the United States to take four milligrams four times a day for two weeks. And we're talking about tremendous amounts of medication. Andrea started using drugs at the age of 16. In the beginning, it made me personally feel like everything was okay, and I think that's the part I liked the most. It took away all my worries. It made me not care. After a while, that, that wears off, and all that the drug does for you anymore is make you feel not sick. You know, you're, you're lucky if you can just get up and walk around for the day. Taryn, the former cheerleader, says addiction took her to desperate places. I was drugged by one of my drug dealers, and I was raped. And I woke up, and when I started fighting against him, he said, if you move again, I'll, I'll, I'll kill you. At the time, all I'm thinking about is, I have to get high so I can block this out so I can't, don't have to think about this. You know, I don't want to talk to my mom. I don't want to talk to my friends. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to get high so I don't have to deal with this. It's tough to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Taryn, Andrea, and Cole told us that their appetite for OxyContin led them to illegal street drugs. It began with OxyContin, and, uh, and that was my drug of choice for a long time. And that became too expensive, so then I moved on to heroin. That's right. Heroin is now cheaper to buy than OxyContin. And the buying and selling of prescription pills for recreational purposes is big business. So we came here to the streets of downtown L.A. to see just how easy it is to buy them. So this is a whole marketplace right here? Yes. You can still buy uh, crack cocaine and heroin or whatever you want down here, but they're more discreet about selling it. You know, for some reason, they, they just, you know, the pills uh, are pretty much sold openly. We took a drive with Sergeant Stephen Opferman of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department and the Health Authority Law Enforcement Task Force, or HALT. He asked us not to reveal his face on camera because of his undercover investigations. That guy with the orange shirt, they're about to do a deal right now with the, old, the older guy. He's not trying to hide this. No. See it? He just ate one and he walked away. In the course of about 30 minutes, we see several transactions happen on this corner, right in front of, of all places, a pharmacy. There she goes. She just handed her the pills right now. She, she, just, she just put them right in her hand. Yeah. So we decide to get a closer look. What, what do you got? What do you, what do you, that's it? And pen, fill out a pen. Like it what else? And fill out a pen, the volume. When I approach her, she offers prescription painkillers and an anti-anxiety medication, which, when taken together, create an intoxicating effect. This black market, says this undercover officer, has gotten the attention of criminals who have devised lots of ways to get their hands on valuable prescription drugs, including stealing doctors' IDs and creating phony prescription pads. This is a real doctor 
where they've actually used his real license number and his real DEA number, but the address is fake and the phone number is a prepaid phone number. It's very well thought out, very well planned, very well organized, so. Uh, this is a, a common meeting spot for what we call cappers, uh, recruiters, people that recruit, um, <clears throat> people that have Medicare cards. Opperman says criminals are also taking advantage of laws designed to make prescription drugs affordable. Here's how it works. Organized crime outfits hire middlemen called cappers. The cappers entice Medicare recipients to ride with them to pill mills, where the Medicare recipients pick up prescriptions from willing doctors. The cappers then take them to pharmacies to pick up the drugs, which under Medicare are free. The cappers pay the Medicare recipients a few hundred dollars for the drugs, which are then sold on the black market for a profit. Say if I get 90 uh, Oxycontin tablets, I can sell that for at least $2,000 now. Sergeant Opferman's team was part of a sting that led to indictments against a Los Angeles drug ring that allegedly sold 900,000 Oxycontin pills on the street, generating millions of dollars in profits. So what are the solutions to the prescription drug epidemic? The DEA sponsors events where you can dispose of unused pharmaceuticals. Government officials are also calling for a prescription monitoring system. California has one, but it's voluntary and doctors have to sign up for it. You know, the patient comes in and says they have a back problem and that they take about 30 Vicodin in a month, but you're able to see that last month they had 120 prescribed. You know, it's easier for you to say, listen, you had 120 pills prescribed last month. What's really going on? Health giant Kaiser Permanente says its doctors have decreased their prescriptions of OxyContin by 60 percent since January of 2010. And it has initiated safeguards against the overprescription of OxyContin and other commonly abused drugs. So we put up all of these barriers to prescribing OxyContin. We have actually inserted various alerts and warnings that come up anytime a physician attempts to prescribe, let's say, OxyContin or Opana, one of the other drugs of abuse in the community. So these kinds of alerts, you know, keep us on the ball. We should be able to get in there and, um, you know, continue with our presentation and now that we have the flyers and the handouts, so. As for um, Kathy Creedon, she's formed a nonprofit called Mothers Against Prescription Drug Abuse and has been working with Congressperson Mary Bono Mack on legislation that would make it more difficult for doctors to prescribe drugs like OxyContin. I saw my son's addiction progress rapidly once he became addicted to OxyContin. That's what the legislation is all about, is to make it uh, mandatory that before they can renew, they will be required to have this training. And I just believe in my heart that they will be more careful about it when they um, understand the, um, the seriousness of addiction. But in a culture where an ever-increasing array of powerful addictive drugs are just a medicine cabinet away, where criminals are driven only by the sure windfall of supplying steady demand, legislation alone might be a little like bringing a knife to a gunfight. And joining us now is Michael Oku. Michael, that was an incredible story. But if there's this database out there that could help solve this problem, why aren't doctors using it? It's a great question, and it's, it's a really hard question to answer conclusively. You probably have to go to... Each doctor has their own reason, but I think it's safe to say that, that, that doctors don't want to think of their patients as being dishonest any more than patients would want to think of their doctors as being dishonorable. So when you talk to doctors, they tell you, look, our role, our mandate is very simple. It's to treat the patient. It's to find a remedy. And it turns out that they have to do that in a pretty concentrated period of time, according to some surveys that were done back in 2004, apparently a typical doctor's visit is about seven and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. So that means in that seven and a half minutes, a doctor has to uh, essentially interview the patient, find out what ails them, uh, diagnose them, document them, and then come up with what that diagnosis is, that remedy. And uh, I'll tell you, in seven and a half minutes, when you start thinking about this added step of having to, you know, access a database, which may take another four or five minutes, I tell you that most doctors would probably think that's setting up an inefficient practice. Just one more thing to do, which means there's more responsibility on the parents. So how can parents tell that something's wrong? Oh, boy, that, that is the, 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 you know, million-dollar question, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the experts will tell you that you've got to just know your child. So you have to assume early on, even before they're at the age where they might be able to start taking prescription pills, know what their 
patterns are. So when you start seeing changes in their patterns, then you're alerted that something might be going on. So the typical things may be their sleep patterns. Uh, are they beginning to go to bed later? Does it take them longer to get up? Has there been some significant change in the way they dress or the people they hang out with? Are they more or less irritable? Mm -hmm. Look into this stuff and then don't be afraid to confront your child. If you, if you feel that, that there's something physically wrong with them, stand them in front of the mirror and take a look at their pupils and see if they're that much more dilated than yours. If you think that there's a problem and that it's consistent, don't be afraid to take them to the doctor, tell them what your concerns are, and have, uh, have your child tested. Great advice. Thank you very much, Michael. And we'll be right back with the Unger Report. What percentage of prescription drug abusers said the medicines they most recently abused came from friends or relatives? 40%, 60%, or 80%? 80% got their pills from friends or family. 